uh, Ozark streams are known for their beauty, for their clear water. You can see many feet deep, see the gravel. Uh, people come from all over to float in these streams, uh, such as the Jack's Fork and the Current River. However, those streams aren't what they were at settlement either in that they filled in a lot. Historically, during the Native American period, these streams would have been much larger, uh, contain sizable populations of fish and other water, uh, amphibians. Uh, we, we have campsites upstream from here where Native Americans lived year-round next to the streams. They were not gravel choked like they are now. Right after settlement, the, uh, as we put in a railroad across the western plains, they cut the ties out of the Ozarks, and those were hand-cut ties, railroad ties, and they would bring them and get them in the river, put a huge bunch together, tie them together, and float huge rafts of ties downstream to wherever, uh, such as Donovan on the Arkansas line, where they load them on railroads. For instance, on the Big Piney west of Houston, they actually put tie rafts together there and flowed them to St. Louis. And uh, now you actually have to uh, get out and uh, portage your canoe in places just to get over rapids. As uh, another reference, uh, using Schoolcraft again and his uh, journey in 1818, 1819 through this area, he mentioned he got quite detailed descriptions of streams and stream crossings, but he rarely mentioned gravel. I want to show you today how some of that has changed. Uh, in, uh, when I was young, in about, if you go back to 1955 to 1965, where we're sitting here now with the neighborhood swimming hole above this concrete slab. Water, we're sitting here on a gravel bar now where then you could, uh, water could have easily been six feet deep. There was a huge rock right about here you dove off of. Uh, and uh, today this is all gravel field. And uh, at that time, this was uh, a great stream to wade and fish. You, you had fish came up every year with the spring floods and, uh, they, there was plenty of, plenty of water year round for them to live. You could catch eating size fish. Uh, my, going back even further, when my dad was young, they actually had seines and sane this area for fish to eat. In early 19, in the 2000 and early 2000s, we, uh, our church held a baptism here yet. There was still enough water to have a baptism. And, uh, now we're set, where we're setting is a gravel bar. We're probably setting on a total of eight feet of gravel here now. We also own a farm on Piney River and we're going to gigging now back in the 1930s, 40s, the young man that was raised there said that when they, they went gigging, you, this one long eddy, you could hardly touch the bottom with a 14 foot long gig pole. You, now you can actually wade and fish that same stream. It has had so much gravel added. That's just a readily, uh, apparent change of the Ozarks. We've, uh, through our management, through, through gravel roads, through erosion, we have uh, put huge amounts of gravel moving down these streams, either with stream banks eroding or just erosion off a of field. And going back to uh, the, the settlement era, with the springs, at that time, when the settlers came, of course, you did not have wells, so it was very important that you locate your homestead within a reasonable distance of a spring for household water and livestock water. So uh, at that time, we had lots of, the soils was in a lot better shape. We had uh, year-round spring flow of springs that now are totally 
totally dried up except there's maybe will run for a few days after a heavy rainfall. And there at our headquarters is where there's a spring fed pond there and that spring was my grandmother's refrigerator. She kept little little building built on the edge over the spring and that's where they kept their their butter, their milk, uh, any perishables like that. And it'd be cool that we now th just easily do with the refrigerator. And she she made a thousands of trips up and down that hill to get the butter, get the milk, take the to keep it stocked. So and uh, those, those springs now run, run very little, very function, and because our soils are compacted and it just. Uh, water does not infiltrate and come out of these springs and be stored in the soil and come out of these springs when, when we do have rainfall. And, and on the springs, one reason they function so well at settlement time is our soils were, would have been more, more resembled like cottage cheese and they had openings in them and uh, a place for water to infiltrate and work its way down into the, into the system and come out really slowly. And this was a function of the native plants that would have been here in, first in the savannas and the, uh, because you had, uh, two or three hundred different species of plants. So you had real deep roots, you had shallow roots, you had, um, roots that, some of them regenerated easily every year, making organic matter in a sponge type material. So we had that then. And then uh, as we have uh, eliminated those plants, we and replaced them with monocultures of more shallow rooted cool season plants, we have damaged our soil. We have reduced the organic matter a lot. We have just uh, consolidated, compacted the structure of the soil. It does not absorb water now like it would have back uh, at settlement time or afterwards. The um, you you can we can get an inch rain now, and if it comes kind of fast, you can get a, actually get a rise here on this stream we're looking at, and would not have would not have influenced it at all at settlement times. So at the time of the of settlement and uh, Native Americans prior to that, uh, these streams were not gravel choked like they are now, and our soils held the water, so it was a a lot more resilient system. Uh, a drought or dry period did not influence things the way it does today. Three weeks of no rain and we're in a severe drought. Uh, with with all the native plants and the old system. Uh, it would have been a dry period, but it would not have been a major drought instantly. We've reduced our streams to the point that we're actually endangering some of the animals, amphibians that uh, are endemic to this, to this area. We, for instance, the Ozark Hellbender is endangered now. And even Giggin, when I was in 1960, uh, he was very prominent in the streams. You've seen him rather often uh, now they're almost almost gone uh, so we got numerous examples of this how how we're reducing the capability of these ecosystems to function and take care of not only society but all the plants animals amphibians and on the theme of endangered plants and animals uh, we have just a few remnant patches of river cane yet on Piney River and uh, where agriculture hasn't been able to take them out. And uh, according to accounts of the settlement era, the, uh, the cane breaks were quite extensive on a lot of our rivers. We think I'm being totally socked in with uh, woody trees, but you apparently had huge areas maybe that would have been totally covered with cane, river cane. River cane is a plant that in our area will get maybe 10 feet tall. It's got year-round uh, 
green growth on it, which makes it uh, susceptible to year-round grazing when we had open-range livestock and later. And uh, But it is a plant that spreads not only by seed, but by underground rhizomes. So you can have a half acre patch that's all just one plant that spread by rhizomes through the through the long period of time. There's all the stories of Daniel Boone and uh, killing bears out of the cane break in Kentucky and places. And uh, so those cane breaks came up into Missouri rather, rather good. It would have been a integral part of our river system, which there again, uh, for water infiltration it was, was not erosive at all. This video is part of a series on what the land was like before European settlement in Missouri. Watch our other videos on prairies and savannas, glades, wildlife, and Native Americans in pre-settlement times. And even if you're not from Missouri, we hope these videos can help you learn how to read the history of your own landscape. <laughs>